Um, hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here. I, I um, and and to have a little time with Boyd this morning. I, th I think of Boyd as the Matthew McConaughey of Nebraska, with his cool vibe. I can see him in a Chrysler talking to a camera. All right, all right, all right. Very cool. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I have a lot of information that I want to share with you. I want to start by just giving a little context as to who Firespring is, uh, so you know what we're about, because I'm going to be sharing a lot of our story as we move forward. Uh, we provide marketing and printing, software, strategic guidance to thousands, about 10,000 uh, brands, businesses, nonprofits all over the world, 12 countries, six continents, and in all 50 states. And our business is basically divided into two different parts. We have a marketing and printing company. Basically, it's a company that is a creative agency that does printing as well. And then we do software as a service. And uh, when we think through those two things in terms of how we apply them, it started, we started in the printing business. That's where we got our start way back in the early 90s. And uh, everything from, from annual reports to yard signs and everything in between. And uh, a couple years ago, actually last year in June of 2016, how many people read Printing News Magazine? It's a, it's a fantastic read. I'm sure everyone in the room reads Printing News Magazine. We were featured in Printing News Magazine as the largest sheet-fed printing operation in North America, and it's right here in Omaha and Lincoln. Um, and most people aren't even aware of that. We, we have a broad reach throughout the region. Um, in the software as a service business, our focus is primarily on helping nonprofit organizations uh, elevate their purpose. We help them by um, giving them the technology and tools to manage their members and to increase uh, and retain donors and all the important things that they have to do. And then in our creative agency, uh, we have a very specific focus on helping purpose-driven businesses. Our intention as a company is to work with other businesses that operate more on their why than on their what. We want to work with other like-minded companies in that regard. So that's what we're focused in. Um, and as part of that, we also help, their, um, help them f figure out from the inside out how to align around purpose as, as a company. So oftentimes, a lot of the businesses that we work with uh, work with uh, leadership resources and, and, and other companies that help them really figure out how to really dig in and understand purpose. We also have a business incubator uh, where we've had four different companies over the last few years. One uh, company called Payment Spring, which is a, now a Nelnet-owned company here in Omaha an amazing company. Um, we started that as an incubator uh, business inside of Firespring as a way to radically change and reinvent the payment process, uh, the, the, the way companies take payments. Because up until then, if you, had, uh, the, if you had a need to take payments on your phone, you had to use Square. If you had, uh, wanted to take them in person, you had to use um, a different payment processor. And if you wanted to do something online, you had to do something different yet. It allowed um, a business to take payments through all different modalities of payment through one interface. It's, re it's a really cool um, process, and, and that company is now rapidly growing. We have a book publishing company called Redbrush and a software company called Traction Tools that helps companies that are implementing um, the Entrepreneur Operating System, or EOS, in their business use tools to manage that process, and then uh, Blue Stem Fiber, which is out to radically change the way small communities across Nebraska bring fiber into those communities to give them access at a high level. So the other thing that we've been focused on at Firespring is growth by acquisition. If you go back to 1988 in Lincoln, there was a company called Jacob North that started that year, and 1919 in Omaha when Standard Blue opened its doors, and we added together all of the different businesses that have now become part of the Firespring family over the years. There are 42 brands and 21 different acquisitions that we've done. The majority of those in Lincoln, 12 in, in Lincoln, six in Omaha, and then three in other places. Um, and uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, we've been on the Inc. fastest growing companies list uh, for seven of the last nine years. And in 2016, we were featured in the inaugural uh, uh, Inc. magazine, 50 best places to work list, um, which we're really proud of. And I'm gonna say that, and then I'm gonna also say and follow on to that, um, but I know damn well we're not one of the 50 best companies to work for in the entire United States of America. There are a lot of amazing companies out in the world. Um, it's, uh, it was a little bit um, humbling when, we came, when I came back to the office and had a conversation with our leadership team about, okay, we were being included in this publication, um, and we were looking around at each other thinking, oh man, we have so much work to do. There's so much yet ahead of us and so many things that we need to, yet, we need to still figure out. And that's really what I'm going to dig in and talk about today. 
I want to share with you our journey around the topic of culture. I believe that culture is the single most important thing that dictates a business's opportunity to succeed year over year, decade over decade. Companies that get this are the ones that are the leaders in, in nearly every category. And I'm going to dig in and share a little bit of our story about how we see culture um, as a journey, not a destination. Being able to really focus on the right things as a, as a company moving forward. I also, I see, I see culture as kind of like a shadow. Um, it's not tangible. You can't touch it. You can feel it. You know when it's there, but you can't really touch it. And I've got a photo here I'd like you to take a look at. I'm going to brighten it up a little bit here. What do you see in that photograph? If you look really closely, what you'll see is a photograph of nine zebras from the top. It's a straight on shot looking straight down late in the afternoon. So the shadows that they're casting um, are really dominant. And that's the way that I see culture. Culture is the shadow. It's not the object itself. But culture is everything. And culture is what drives the opportunity for all of us to be successful in our companies. Um, I think Maya Angelou said it better than anyone. And she wasn't talking about company culture. But I've never heard a better definition of company culture than this, when she said that you know, we've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And there is no better definition of, of a company culture than that sentiment right there. Maya Angelou is one of my all-time heroes. She's, uh, she's a, um, I, I think I've read everything she's ever written, and, and I think she's one of the most brilliant humans to have ever walked the planet. Um, and in particular, when, when, when I started to think about how we think about culture and what culture really is and how it, how it emanates um, as a journey, not a destination, um, I think that definition fits it best. So I'm going to go back and share the beginning of our journey with you at Firespring. When, when, when the idea behind building a company built around culture was first seeded. And for me, it started when I was a kid in the early 1980s. Um, I went to North Platte High School out in central Nebraska, and I was elected to student council my sophomore year to serve my junior year. And I, I don't usually share this part, but um, uh, actually every kid that ran got elected to student council. You know, was, we're, I'm part of the everybody gets a trophy generation. And what, what happened, though, is that the student council advisor came in and said, all right, if you want to serve on council, if you want to actually be on the council the junior, your junior year, then you have to go through leadership training. And so that took two forms. One, I was allowed to go to a leadership class at school, which was on Saturday afternoon for four hours every Saturday for like eight weeks, which sounded absolutely ridiculous um, to a 15-year-old kid, how you would like, give up half of your summer like that. Besides, the vice principal that taught the class reminded me a lot of the vice principal from The Breakfast Club. You remember the guy in that you know, beat up Judd Nelson in the closet? Yeah, that guy. Um, so I didn't want to really do that. Instead, I took the second option, which was to attend a summer leadership workshop that was put on by an organization called NASC, the Nebraska Association of Student Councils, which is now called Launch Leadership. I've now been on the volunteer staff of this organization for more than 30 years. But at that point in time, I spent an entire week in a room with kids from other schools around Nebraska. It was the first time I met a lot of people not like me, Growing up in central Nebraska, you know, there, there, there's not a lot of ethnic diversity. There's not a lot of thought diversity. Um, there, there just isn't really um, a lot going on at that point in time before the internet, before, you know, um, be, be, before the world had changed so dramatically because of the internet. Um, it was a different world. And I, I had the gift given to me when I was a 15-year-old kid of having my life completely changed by learning the value and the importance of servant leadership when I was 15 years old in this group of, of 12 kids. I learned what it means to think about others before myself. And in the room, there was a sign that hung on the wall that the leader of my group allowed me to take with me at the end of the week. And um, it said, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good, therefore, that I could do or any kindness I can show, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it for I shall not pass this way again, is the Stephen Grillet quote. And I remember that whole week seeing it on the wall and thinking, thinking, thinking. At the end of the week, I took this off the wall 
and I carried it home with me. I've had it ever since. It's been hanging either on the mirror in my bathroom or in my closet or on my desk at work. It's been with me ever since. I still have it to this day. And it's something that I've really worked hard to try to um, model my life and career after. And I remember thinking at the time, I was already wired as an entrepreneur and I knew I wanted to start things. And I kept thinking about how can I start something where this is the embodiment of what becomes the business and the company and my career and the people around me. So I went off on my journey, um, started all kinds of different businesses and companies, and finally settled on one that worked. It was called Campus Connection. Started at, my, at the beginning of my junior year in college. Um, we ended up growing uh, I, to uh, uh, 350 college campuses all around the United States with a distribution of 1.5 million. It was a magazine that was published to, uh, to college students. And back then, again, before the internet, I know it's hard to imagine, um, we had these, these, uh, these guidebooks. When a student arrived at class the first week of school, they would get this when they bought their books at the beginning of the semester. Um, and it had a best of list, the, the, the best place to get a haircut, the best place to go on a date, the best place to do this, the best place to do that. It basically um, allowed the students on campus to really know what to do um, with, with their time and with their day. Um, I sold that business in late 91 because my son had, uh, had been born. Um, when he was about a year old, I decided I wanted to move back to Nebraska so he could grow up on grass instead of concrete. And moved back to Lincoln and started an Alpha Graphics print shop. I don't know what it was about printing that got me so excited, but I remember, I remember being in college, I was the guy that had really great looking reports. They had great covers and the fonts were beautiful. Um, and I, you know, even though I got like a C minus on the paper, it, it looked damn good. And I remember feeling really good about that. Um, so there was something about the printing business that appealed to me. And so I came to Lincoln, started this, uh, this print shop, and that's when I learned the value of R&D, which I've already sensed is the theme for today. Um, uh, R&D, who knows what R&D stands for? Yeah? That is one answer, yes, and that would be a correct answer, but that's not my, is not, my answer is rip off and duplicate. <laughs> so here's what I mean by, by R&D. My father said, you know, okay, you're starting this company. How many other Alpha Graphics, it was a franchise. How many other Alpha Graphics franchises are there? And I said, well, like 200 in the United States. Okay, well, go find out what they've done, what they did. And I did, I got in a, in a plane, I flew to the east and west coast, rented cars and drove, and then I drove from, from Lincoln. Over the course of about three months, I literally walked into more than 100 Alpha Graphics stores and introduced myself as this uh, kid from Nebraska. You know, I was in my, um, uh, I was 26 years old at the time. Um, and I would walk in and say, I'm you know, Jay Wilkinson, I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm starting an Alpha Graphics store. I was wondering if you would talk to me, and every single person that I approached, every business, uh, either the owner, and if the owner wasn't available, someone else there sat down and chatted with me, and uh, some of them, I stayed with them for half a day, or almost the entire day, and I asked them all kinds of questions. You know, what, what kind of things do you do that work? What kind of things don't work? I, I said, if you could go back to the beginning and start fresh today, what would you do differently right out of the gate? I had notebooks full of ideas and notes, and I came back to Lincoln, and launched my store, and of course, within six months, we had set an all-time sales record for the franchise, because all I did was what other people had, had shared with me they would have done differently. It was about taking other people's ideas, iterating on them, making them my own, and building something really cool around it. And that's what we should all be doing, especially in today's world where we have the internet, and we have this, uh, this autodidactic capability where we can all just basically find anything and look anything up and, and access whatever it is that we need to access in order to be able to move forward really effectively. I, I don't see any value um, in trying to recreate something out of the thin air that has already been created or invented. Um, take what's already there and build upon it. That's what society is all about. So that's what I'm gonna encourage you to do the rest of the day today. And then fortunately for me, um, a couple years later, Al Gore came along and invented the internet. Thank you, Al. And we decided in our company that we wanted to jump on this train. Here, here's something fascinating. I think, I hope you might find this fascinating. The beginning of 1995, many of us, I can, I can see there are many faces here that were actually around in 95, but a couple of you were like in the womb at the time, I know. But in 1995, the beginning of that year, there were fewer than 5,000 commercially available websites in the entire world. 
by the end of 1995, by the end of that year, there were millions of them and it was growing rapidly. That was the year that everything really started to take off. And we knew we wanted to be part of that trend and part of that growth, so we started a division of our company called Level 100 Communications, which was intended to really capitalize on building websites and building out. And then we landed um, our first big client. All right, who knows who these guys are? Just Backstreet Boys. All the guys are pretending like they don't know because it's gonna, we're gonna have to take your man card if you know who the Backstreet Boys are. But it's the Backstreet Boys. And so one of our employees was on a bucket list trip over in Spain, they're running to the bulls, and he tells the story that he's standing like on the edge of his hotel balcony looking down and these throngs of women are screaming and yelling and he's trying to figure out what he did to deserve all this attention. And then he leans over on the balcony next to him are the Backstreet Boys. Um, he shared a, a door with them. He had one of those adjoining doors in his hotel room. He spent the entire rest of the week hanging out with them. He got to go backstage at their concert and hang out. Um, he came back, and we still have the, the hotel receipt. On the back of it, he wrote out a little contract. We, we, we did their website um, on, on, uh, on, on, it was the very first website that they ever created, and it put us on the map. We started doing work for all of the local ad agencies at the time. So if you, if you were an ad agency in Nebraska in that time frame, in the mid-90s, um, our company, Level 100, pretty much did all of the back-end website design and development, and then they would ship it out. And now every ad agency does their own website um, design. A lot has changed in the world. But that's how we got our start, and we started to grow really rapidly into that into the world. Coming back to all the way fast forward to 2013, I had a conversation with my father. My father, um, his name is Gil. Um, um, th there are no more Gilberts anymore, so he's one of the last remaining Gilberts in the world. And he is, is absolutely my, my hero. He's, he's an amazing human. Um, and um, I, I think most of my life I've lived to try to just be, um, to, to honor my father in some way, um, to, to, to give back what he gave to me. My dad was my scoutmaster. He had 23 Eagle Scouts in his scout troop, which is an awful lot, and I was, I was one of them, and it, and it was a really important part of my childhood. He was my youth sports coach. When I was in high school playing sports, he was one of the six or seven dads that would be parked along the road next to the practice field, and he would come and watch every practice, not just every game. Um, and he was just one of those dads that was completely 100% all in and present in every way. And I've spent my lifetime trying to figure out how to live up to that and to repay him as a father myself. And, and I remember um, thinking all along the way that someday, someday I'm going to do something really cool for my dad to honor his legacy. Someday I'm going to figure that out. And someday I'm going to save up enough money or create enough wealth or whatever. And I was always focused on that someday. I, I think a lot of us probably you know, will, will say those words a little too often. Someday I'm going to do this. Someday I'll do that. And I remember having a conversation with my dad, this was in 2013, and I, I sat down with him and I started to dig a little bit. I wanted to understand what he felt was most important to him, what he wanted his legacy to be. I have in my, the back of my head, maybe I can build, um, a, you know, a, a, buy some land and name a park after him or maybe a hospital wing or whatever. And in the conversation I was having with my dad, he figured out what I was digging for, you know, pretty quickly and he started laughing. And I said, why are you laughing? He said, I, he said I, wh why are you asking me these questions? He said, I, the only thing I care about is the, the only legacy that I want to leave is with my kids and my grandkids. That's, that's it. I want to have kids and grandkids that contribute to society and, and, and do amazing things and live amazing lives. And that's it. He doesn't care about a hospital wing or anything else. And I remember sitting there thinking it, and lying in bed that night thinking, well, what am I trying to do here with, with, my, with my life, trying to build up this someday thing. And I came back to the office the next day, and, and I'd been thinking about it. I laid up most of that night, and I sat down with my leadership team at work. And many of you have probably been in conference rooms where there's someone from your company that's been to a conference, and they had that deer-in-the-headlight look in their eyes, like, oh, shit, Jay's been to a conference. Everything's going to change. Um, and so we're, we, we have this conversation, and, and I explain... I, I want to change everything about the way our business operates. And, and I shared with them that I'd been doing some research, which I had the night before, and I had been researching about B Corporations to know what a B Corporation is. Um, and I shared with them that we were going to become 
a B corporation, and we have to do it now. Um, the, 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 this thing that I had, had had hanging on my mirror for like most of my adult life, all of a sudden just slapped me in the face and the words do it now jumped off the page at me. And I knew that's what we had to, had to do. So in 2014, we became the first B Corporation in the state of Nebraska. I have a little video that tells a little more about what B Corporations are. We have a dream that one day all companies will compete not only to be the best in the world, but the best for the world. Others share this dream and have begun to turn the dream into a community. This community signed a declaration of interdependence and invited others to join them. Now, more than 2,000 companies from 50 countries are turning our community into a global movement to redefine success in business. B corporations use the power of business to solve social and environmental problems. An eyewear company that disrupts an industry and serves the poor. A shoe company that gives to children in need throughout 70 countries. An outdoor apparel company that stewards the environment. A brewing company that diverts 99.9% .9 of its waste. An ice cream company that maintains its mission post-sale. A marketing company that donates 3% of its people, products, and profit to the community. B Corp is a certification that helps consumers identify these change makers and investors make money and make a difference. As a community, we are passing laws across the country, creating a new kind of company that serves society and shareholders. We are leading a global movement of people using business as a force for good. Join us. Be the change. So it's not just B corporations. There are companies that are aligned with the conscious capitalism movement. Some are part of 1% for the planet. But using business as a force for good is something that has become deeply ingrained in my DNA. And, and um, I'm working um, a lot with some folks in Lincoln that are um, working on initiatives to try and educate more businesses across the state of Nebraska to understand the importance of aligning their business and their company and their people more behind their why than their what. Um, using business as a way to create impact, not just with the employees of that business, but in the communities that those businesses serve. And it's something that's really important, I think, for all of us. And I, I want Nebraska to be a leader in this, in this, uh, in this area. And it's something that uh, there are several initiatives that are going on right now. We have a new conference coming to Nebraska. It will be either in Omaha or Lincoln um, in the spring of 2019 called the Do More Good Conference. Um, that we're working on in parallel with a lot of other organizations to try to create um, more momentum around bringing Nebraska companies together behind this, this, this resolve. Our purpose as a business in those days that followed that conversation I had with my father became to leverage our people, our products, and our profit as a force for good. And we do that through our Power of Three program where we give 3% of our people, that's done by having every employee in our entire business, volunteer one full day every month. If you do the math on that over the course of a year, it's more than 3% of their time. 3% of our products are given away to nonprofits, uh, mostly uh, nonprofits, and especially in the Nebraska area, um, where we can help them leverage and grow at a faster rate. And then 3% of our profit. We actually take 3% of our top line revenue and donate it back to the Fire Spring Foundation, which in turn supports um, nonprofits throughout the country, but mostly again in the Lincoln and Omaha areas. Um, my, um, my favorite project that we've worked on to date as part of our Power of Three initiative has been the Nonprofit Hub in Lincoln. How many people know about Nonprofit Hub? It's an awesome organization um, in Lincoln, and they have this great space that uh, makes it possible for nonprofits to come together, and, uh, and, and it's really beautiful. And today, there are more than 100 nonprofit organizations that use this building as their home base. It's a 14,000 square foot building. And instead of paying thousands of dollars for rent somewhere, which, which they used to have to do, they are now able to spend just a couple hundred dollars and have a conference room and coffee and the camaraderie of having other people around that you can be, um, that, that you can share ideas with and really elevate. It's been a really awesome thing to see. Um, we're working on bringing uh, the nonprofit hub concept to Omaha. We're in the process of rebranding right now. We're changing the name of, of the organization to the Foundry, the Foundry Community. Um, and we're opening up a coffee shop. It's going to open up in November. Um, we have local brewers, actually, that are brewing beer specifically for, uh, for the Foundry. And every brewery is going to donate beer that will be sold 
um, specifically through the foundry, and 100% of the profits, not just a portion of, 100% of all of the profits are going to go back to the community to be given to a nonprofit, a different nonprofit every month. So we're, we're using it as a way to drive um, awareness and impact in our community and creating a community gathering space on the lower level of the building where, the, where, where, the, where this is located. It's really cool. And one of my favorite parts about it is the nonprofit hub has grown nationally. There are more than 40,000 um, daily visitors that come and read the content and the information that the editors and the, the writers from the nonprofit hub are putting out. So it's become a national resource that, that benefits nonprofits all over the country. It's really cool to see what's happened. So coming back to culture, everything related to culture starts with, um, starts with the why, but then it really, it, it, you have to be aligned around core values in order for any culture to take hold. And so we see all the time different companies that go through the process of establishing, you know, this is what we value. So it's values like we see on the screen here, respect, integrity, communication, excellence. What I see when I see this list, um, besides, you know, like a little bit, I want to yawn a little bit and say, well, okay, there's nothing really unique or fun or interesting about these expressions of values. And they're not even really values, they're, they're virtues. And, and just so everybody here is aware, these kind of values, which are very typical in most companies, this is what you see with most companies, are words like this or these actual words. Or probably, I know, I don't want to make you raise your hand because I know there are people in this room that have words like respect, integrity, communication, excellence in your value statement. But these are the actual values that hung on the wall at Enron in the lobby. On the day that you know, the feds came in and, and took out their CEO and handcuffed, these were the values that hung on, on, the, on the lobby wall. They don't really mean anything if you don't really understand how to live them, how you embody these values in a day-to-day -day world. Um, so I, I, would, I would suggest that every company use the following test to see if your values hold up. Number one, is the value distinguished? Is it different? Is it something that feels unique to, to, to your company, your organization? Something that, 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 that distinguishes your organization or company from someone else? Number two, are you obsessed with it? Are the employees in your organization, are the different people that are living these values, are they completely obsessed with, with these particular values? And number three, will it outlive the people that are in the room at the moment that the values are created? Is it something that will endure from, from generation to generation as different employees come through the organization? Would you sacrifice money to protect it? Would you would you say goodbye to a client or a customer that was paying you a lot of money if you learned that they were in opposition of what you value as an organization? And then lastly, can you actually live the value every day? And to that end, I believe in expressing values in a way that can be understood so that, so that people in the organization knows what it means to live the value. So these are our values at FireSpring. We only have three, I believe. Um, better, or I, I believe uh, less is more. There are only three values in our, in our entire organization. One is we bring it every day. And I could go very deep in explaining the nuance and, and the detail behind each of these three. Number two is we have each other's back. It goes beyond just the people around us. It goes out to our clients and our vendors. Um, we forget often vendors in, in thinking them through how our values extend. Because I know a lot of type of companies, you know, someone comes in and said, yeah, I got them to lower their price by another $3,000, you know, and, and they take pride in beating up a vendor um, over something rather than having a partnership with, with a vendor that allows you to have a symbiotic relationship and work together. Um, so we extend this out in all ways. And then the third one is we give a shit. I will be honest, I struggled with this one a little bit in the beginning, um, in the expression of the sentiment. Um, I was lobbying for something like, we care deeply, which now sounds so lame, and I'm so glad that they, um, that, that they talked me into it. Um, but a lot of our younger workers um, were adamant about the expression of this sentiment to be stated in a way that's so deliberate, we give a shit. Everybody knows what that means. Everybody knows what it means to live that value and what it looks like. And so we have countless, hundreds upon hundreds of stories in our organization of people that live these values every day. And that's what it's about. We can create story after story about people who bring it, who have each other's back, and who give a shit, and the people in our organization 
are the people that, that are at the epicenter of all three of those. Um, we have a daily meeting at Firespring. I, I know several people have heard about this. Uh, it, we, we've been doing it for more than 11 years. It's, uh, we just hit our 11th anniversary a few months ago of doing this meeting. Every single business day at 11.11, we have an 11-minute meeting, and we've been doing it every year for 11 years, um, fitting on 9-11 today. Um, it's a really important, a really critical, it's a fundamental aspect of our business and our organization. And what we do at this meeting is we recognize each other for living our values. We stand and we call out people for living our values and we put them on the board. We give a quick update as to what's going on around the organization. Um, everyone in the company knows what's going on at all times in the organization because they come to the daily meeting. Our remote team members participate remotely via cameras and Everybody knows what's going on every day. It's a really important part of our, 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 um, our business operation and how we think. We also, once a quarter, will induct people into our Values Hall of Fame. So people are uh, nominated and then and once a quarter, we, we nominate and, and, then, and then induct three new people into the Values Hall of Fame. But it's not just the person, it's the story that goes with the person. And at the end of the year, we publish a book, the Values Hall of Fame, annual for 2018, for example. And so that when a new employee starts in 2019, they're given a copy of the book and they know exactly what it means to live the values of this company. There is no better training you can do than to read real stories of things that people have actually done to live the values of the company and to express it in a way that's so um, specific and laid out right in front of your eyes. So it's a really important part of how, how we operate. And then we have the fire spring promise. It, uh, it starts with our people. We value people above profit. If we take great care of our people, our people will take great care of our clients. It starts there first and foremost. And then our clients, we are obsessed with our client success. Each and every client has the capacity to change the world. And the more clients we have, the more impact we make. That is so important. This is our way of being unapologetically capitalists. Um, I get asked all the time, from people that don't really get it. Jay, you know, okay, it's, it's great that you care so much about culture and about all your do-good stuff and all this, but you gotta make money. You know, if you watch Shark Tank and hear Mr. Wonderful talk, um, it's, it's, it's not about making people feel good, it's about making money, it's about the bottom line. Well, you can get those same exact results and even better results if you build a business that's based on the right premise and the right promise, and the promise for us um, is that if we do our job, we get more clients, and the more clients we have, the more impact we can make. And our philosophy is that we work with purpose and we live our values. We believe in fixing what's broken and cultivating what works. We are invested in the power of transparency. We are aligned in our words and actions. We make and keep big promises. This is the fire spring promise that we um, re reiterate over and over and over again with our team. So it's one thing to get up and share with everybody here and share some ideas related to culture and how, how important culture is and, and being a company aligned around your why. But I find more value in actually sharing the secret sauce. You know, the how do we go about doing this in a way that allows us to, um, what, what, what's the engine and the, and the framework and the guide rails that allow us to do this in a really effective way? So that's what I'm gonna share with you. Um, and the good news is that there is no more organization, I would imagine that most of the people in this room are already aware of the, of the fundamentals that I'm gonna share with you here in a moment because Leadership Resources is a leader in the entire region um, in this area of aligning businesses around the entrepreneur operating system and Traction. Um, so um, in fact, just by showing of hands, how many people know or have read the book Traction or know about the entrepreneur operating system? Okay, it looks like about three quarters of the room. Good, so this will be, um, this will be really good reinforcement for, for most of you. The secret sauce that I believe that we employ that, that has allowed us to do what we, what we do are the guide rails. And um, we kind of define it by the six pies, that are the six pieces of the pie um, that create um, the guide rails on running a business in 2018 in an effective way. And the first piece of the pie is around vision. It's about making sure that we know what the vision, where, where this organization, where this company is going, the eight questions that are shared by all. And these are really important questions. It starts with your core values, which I've been talking about, making sure that we're grounded 
in our why. We know what our why is and we have our core values defined. And the next is the what, it's the core focus. What is it that we're focused on? Part of that is your niche. So we define specifically what is it, what kind of opportunities can come before us and we will say yes, we're going to double down and do more of this versus the kind of ideas that come before you and say, you know, that doesn't really fit um, our ideology and our niche, what we're focused on. Maybe let's stay focused on what we're best at. We have a sign hanging in our war room um, that occasionally are, because I put it up more as a, a guidepost for my leadership team to remind me um, that this is what we need to be focused on. But it, it's a TLC quote, don't go chasing waterfalls, stick to the rivers and the lakes that you're used to. Um, <laughs> That's what the niche is all about. It's about staying steadfastly focused on what you're best at. Oh, and then um, uh, the 10-year target is the long-term vision. Jim Collins called it the BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, we have to know out there in the future, it should make you a little bit uncomfortable, but it should be defendable. I should be able to go to a whiteboard and say, all right, this is how we're going to do this. We, um, we, we do this here, we do this here. We might have to do an acquisition here, and we might have to do this here, but if you can... If you can defend it and point out how you're going to achieve this 10-year vision, um, that's what it's about. But it should make everybody in the room squirm a little bit. We're here now and you think we're going to be there in 10 years? That seems impractical. Defend it and, 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 and keep focusing on that 10-year target. Your marketing strategy, that's the who. Your three-year picture, of course, is the near term. This is, the, this is painting a picture of what it's going to be like to be part of this journey in three years. It's not something, it's not the same as a goal. It's not the same as, as a rock or anything else that you might, that, that's part of this. It's a painted picture um, where you visualize what it's going to be like to be part of all this in three years. And then every employee in the company knows absolutely everything on that list. And the, go the idea is that you want them to want to be part of that. You, you want them to be thinking, all right, I've got opportunities. I can go make more money doing this or I can go do that. But I want to be, if that's where we're going to be in three years, I want to be part of that. That's the idea, is you want to create this picture that people buy into and want to be part of. And then your one-year plan, of course, the three to seven most important things that you have to accomplish this year as a company. What are your goals for the year? Your 90-day rock. Stephen Covey is the one that created the term um, rock and is the one that created this. If you, I, I think Stephen Covey is the most brilliant um, mind that's ever um, contributed to the, um, to, to the landscape of self-improvement and just really understanding how to um, how to grow as a human and how to find, how to find alignment. Um, his seven habits of highly effective leaders, I, I still think is the most foundational quintessential work. If you haven't read that, I encourage you to do that. Um, but he's the one that created this idea that humans, we humans do really well in, in 90 day rhythms. Most of you, if you if, and, and I know me in, in, in particular, if I try to set a goal for the year and I don't have milestones or I don't have quarterly rhythms as part of it, it's the 11th month before I start looking at it as, oh, okay, shit, I better get to work. I've got something, I've got to get that done by the end of the year. And, and most of us probably do that. Um, but the human mindset is really perfectly suited for a 90-day rhythm, and that's where the 90-day rocks come from. And then your issues. I'm going to come back and talk about that. That's perhaps the most important of all of these. The second piece of this pie is the people piece. It's having the right people in the right seats on the bus. And I'm a huge, firm believer in the no asshole rule. I believe that um, we need to rid our environs of the people that are cancers to our culture. I don't care how great of a salesperson someone is. If that salesperson, I'm just using this as an example. I apologize to any salespeople in the room. This is not intended at you. Um, but I don't care how great a, this salesperson is. If they come back to the office and they're a bully, and they, and, they, and, they, and they just make everyone else feel about this tall, we have to get them out of this organization. I don't care how, how much of the top line they contribute to. And every company at some point along the way has these kind of people in the organization. We have to be brave enough and strong enough to fight our way out of those relationships and let them um, set sail towards another destination. Um, number three is the data component. 2018, you can't read, you know, turn left or right without hearing about data, the importance of data. This is having a scorecard that allows you to keep track on all the important things in the business. The idea is that I could be cast off to a, a, an island here and you're going to float a little bottle over to me once a week and I open the bottle and pop it open and read the scorecard and all of the data about how the business is operating 
um, will, will inform me to the point that I will know um, whether or not I need to shoot my one flare up and be rescued because I'm enjoying myself. The, the Mai Tais are great here on this island. I want to stay as long as possible. The idea is that you want to be able to capture everything that's the, the essence of the important elements in a scorecard that you can review and know how things are going. The fourth piece is the issues piece. As I said, I believe this is one of, if not the most important part of the entire model. It's having an issues list. Um, and it's not just issues, it's about um, unresolved problems, ideas, opportunities. The people on the front lines of every business are the ones that know best as to what's going on. In most companies, and I would imagine some of the people in this room would probably feel this way, in most companies, the people that are doing the day-to-day the -day frontline work feel like their opinions don't matter. In most companies, they feel like that if they sent an email off or if they wrote something down and dropped it in the idea box or the suggestion box that, you know, that disappears into the ether and is never seen or heard from again, that nothing's ever going to come of it. The vast majority of people that I've talked to in companies around the United States feel like people don't really care what they think. Just get your work done. C come to work, punch the time clock, get here, get your work done, and get home. The truth of the matter is these people are the best source of information and inspiration for ideas and opportunities that can help us grow as an organization. And once we figure this out, the issues thing, there are no more complaints. No longer do people walk around in the hallways, you know, talking to the person next to them saying, man, I really wish we'd do this, or I wish, you know, I wish Jay would do that, or I wish this would happen, because the other person will just look at them and say, well, just add it to the issues list. Because the whole part of the EOS model is to have a, a, a never-ending, ongoing issues list that allows every single, not only allows, but encourages every single human in the company to constantly be bringing their ideas and opportunities up so that we're flourishing and growing as an organization. The fifth piece is the process piece. Um, this is having um, a, everything documented and followed by all. So um, for example, um, the new web uh, project core process. It's the core processes that you document and make available for every aspect of the organization. The idea here is, even though you won't, let's say you're going to take your existing company and franchise it or recreate it in some other community. You're, you're going to Atlanta and you're going to recreate a new business. You have to document everything so well that you can do that and a different people will then come fill the seats and be able to do that. How, what do you need to document? The 20% of the things that get 80% of the work done in your organization, what are the things that need to be documented in order to do that? And then the last piece is the traction piece itself. It's having um, the rocks, the three to seven most important things that we have to get done this quarter in order to move the needle incrementally closer to that one-year plan, which will move us closer to the three-year picture, which will keep us in, in sight of the 10-year target that we've talked about, and then um, the meeting aspect of it, because there is nothing worse in most companies than meetings that drone on and on and on about nothing um, ridiculously frustrating for most humans so the EOS model has what's called an L10 meeting. It's called an L10 because you grade it. You give it a grade of 1 through 10 at the end of every meeting. We've been doing this for six years. And at the end of every meeting, we give it a grade, a scale of 1 to 10. How did we do today as a team? And it's, it's fantastic for us to really know um, that, that we're going to be doing that at the end of the meeting because it keeps us on par, keeps us on focus. So, um, different teams in our organization will be in meetings from 20 minutes up to 90 minutes. Our leadership team is 90 minutes. Some of our production staff on the floor will have a stand-up circle meeting that lasts only 20 minutes, um, but it has the same rhythm and the same agenda every week. It's a consistency. And I believe that the most important thing in any of our companies in terms of making sure that all of this that I'm sharing with you, um, the EOS, the culture, everything, it begins and starts with our ability as a company to train our managers to be effective. The people in every organization, this so often gets forgotten and lost because what happens in most companies? We promote someone to become a manager because why? They've been around the longest or because they were really good at doing their job. That's usually why we promote someone to become a manager. Instead of thinking, well, who's best at managing people? That's not what we think about. We think about, well, she's been around a long time, so she should become a manager. It's just this thing, this thing that we've got to overcome, and it's, it's a problem. So at Firespring, this is, I'm going to share with you the 11 immutable traits of a Firespring manager. Number one on the list is LMA. 
They have to be good at leading, managing, and holding people accountable. And uh, in a moment of vulnerability here, I will share with you that I, when, I, when I came to learn that I was a decent leader, but I wasn't good at managing and holding people accountable, and I was able to um, admit that to myself and to the people around me and um, get rid of all the people that reported to me and just have one person, my integrator, who, who, who everyone else reports up to that person, um, it was like, oh, you know, the, the nirvana happened, the doves flew, it was beautiful because my life changed and so did the lives of the people around me. I no longer was the seagull style of manager, which I used to refer to myself as. I would, I would kind of swoop in, shit on everything and then swoop out <laughs> and then wonder why people aren't getting anything done. I don't, I don't get it. Um, so I, I completely changed that by, by building an LMA paradigm with our managers. Number two, we must, as managers, more than anyone else, must model what it means to live the company values. Number three, managers must encourage every team member to find a better way. Always be thinking about, um, well, there's, there's the way we've been doing it, um, but is that the best way? There's always a better way. Let's find a better way. That, that permeates throughout our organization. We have signs, banners that, that, that could go across our company and we're always reminding ourselves that we can always improve and iterate, find a better way. Number four, inspire your team to add issues and opportunities. It's about building that issues list. Instead of just complaining, inspire them to, to participate in the process. Number five, make decisions. I believe the most underestimated characteristic of a good leader is to be someone who's willing to make a decision. I, I, I've been talking about this with my kids since the time you know, they, they were very young because it's such a simple skill to learn. This is the simplest skill to learn even though most people are horrible at it. So what I would say to my kids is when everybody's talking about, okay, what do we want to do this weekend? Or do you want to go here? Do wanna, what movie do you want to see? Where do you want to go to lunch? The vast majority of us are like, I don't know, you pick, you say something. The people who are the best leaders are the people who are willing to just drop anchor and say, how about Runza? What, is the world gonna come to an end if you suggest something? Throw something out, get the conversation started. It's, it's so simple, it's the simplest skill to learn but the most underrated characteristic of a good leader, someone who's willing to make decisions. Number six, simplify everything you touch. Again, less is more. The sign of a smart person is someone that makes something simple, not complex. Number seven, embrace diverse personalities and know what fuels every person you manage. One of the worst pieces of advice that I ever received was the person who said, you should treat everyone the same, you need to be fair. Totally not true. We should treat each person the way they need to be treated in order to maximize their confidence and their output. That's what it's about. Number eight, trust your team to take things off the plate. Be willing to delegate. We cannot survive as companies unless we are, are able to train people around and trust them to take things off of our plate. And number nine, don't glorify people for working excessive hours. Help them offload critical tasks and find balance in their life. We should not glorify people for, oh, I wanna say, you know, give a shout out to, to Bob over here because he was here all night working on a project. Um, a better way to do it is to say, I wanna give a shout out to Bob because he got this massive project done. You're not gonna glorify the excessive hours part. Glorify the outcome. We have to train our people to, to, to be reasonable in what's expected of them, what kind of hours they're expected to work. We'll, we'll burn people out and send them right out the door if we don't focus on this one. And number 10, model vulnerability. Again, this is one of the themes that I've already heard. Um, you know, I, 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 I used to hear the expressions like, you know, don't let them see you sweat. No, no, let them see you sweat. Let them know you're frustrated. Let them know you're struggling. Let people know that you're dealing with things. We're human. The more vulnerable we can be as a manager, the more we connect with the people in our organization. And the 11th thing that we preach incessantly with our managers is that your team doesn't serve you, you serve your team. It's a mindset shift. And to that end, we take our accountability chart and we flip it on its axis and our, um, our managers are on the bottom and the frontline people are at the top. It's a, it's a message that we're sending that we see this as a real thing. As a manager, your people don't serve you, you serve them. It's a mindset shift. One last thing I wanna talk about with our managers 
we're on a process right now to rethink the way that we deal with, with, with people that are leaving the company. We're getting rid of the two-week notice. Um, we're doing a project called Mindful Transitions where we work with every employee and we share with them. And, and we have to follow up on this, that look, if you, if you have an opportunity, if you're not happy with what you're doing, or you just, or you just think that there's an opportunity and you wanna go start looking, come share it with me as a manager. I will help you through the process. I've got your back. You know, that's a core, a core uh, value that we have as an organization, and we follow through on this. Um, so if someone comes and says, you know, I think it's, I, I'm, I'm, st I'm starting to look around, we give them time off in the afternoon to go interview. We give them the ability to go start looking around, but it, it takes away this, uh, this problem that pe the companies have of the two-week notice, where then you're stuck with these large gaps in time where you don't have things filled. We can start the process right away. It's really um, important, and I'll, I, I've got a lot more working on that. So we're very intentional on our workplace culture, and I'm gonna share a few things about what workplace culture is not. It's not about the perks. It's not about having the fancy stuff. In our case, it's not about having a, a really great break room with beer on tap or free soda or um, free food in the break room. It's not about having a ping pong table or a pool table or a slide. We have all this stuff. It has nothing to do with our culture. It has nothing to do with the way people feel about coming to work. It's not about the party planning committee. We have a culture club that plans our parties, but they also get very substantially involved in helping set the tone on everything we do as an organization. What workplace culture is, it is about the people who are aligned with one another, who bring it, who have each other's back, and who give a shit about each other, about their clients, and our community. That's what it is. That's what it's all about. And to that end, so, you know, community service is the most important thing for our team, the people that are giving back to the community. Last year, we had 14,000 volunteer hours in our community that we tracked through um, a tool that we use to track it. And it's really important to our people. It's about the little things. We have this thing called Souptacular where um, different employees will make soup and bring in their crock pot and then we vote and we give a golden ladle out every year. Um, it kind of got messed up the year that an IT guy uh, melted a brick of Velveeta cheese and, and he won the entire competition because all the soup aficionados who would spend weeks crafting their recipes were like so pissed off that year. Um, <laughs> But having these little things and a Thanksgiving where you know, we put everybody around one table even when we get to more than 200 people are really important to us. It's all about those little things. The bottom line is that we're all in this together. Um, I want to just really quickly as we're wrapping up, I want to extend an invitation. Um, we have a tour at Fire Spring. Since, since we're in Nebraska, I wanted to go on ahead and share this with you. Um, in the spirit of R&D, everything that we've done, um, I've learned from someone else tweaked, iterated, evolved, and, and we are open and want to share it. We want to help more companies continue to, to, to rise and evolve. If you're interested for any reason, um, you can come join us. Uh, we have tours typically on the last Friday of every month. Um, we would love to have you just come join us. It's free. You can bring as many people on your team as you want. 90 minutes. Um, it usually, well, it always starts at 10 a.m. It's in our, in our Lincoln headquarters. Um, and I've got some little cards back here that I can hand you if you want more information about that. I want to finish with this. Um, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to believe that Steve Jobs has been gone now for over seven years. Um, but in his 2005 commencement address, he said, your work is going to fill a large part of your life and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, don't settle. Keep looking. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just keeps getting better and better as the years roll on. Keep looking, don't settle. And I wanna share this email with you. This is an email that I received nearly 10 years ago now from one of our um, employees um, when I first started to really think heavily about the impact of culture. And she wrote, hi Jay, I was getting ready for work this morning, excited for the waffle breakfast, and it occurred to me that I look forward to quite a few things that are related to my job. I have a tendency to gush about Firespring. I rave about the company, the work, the people, our clients, the fun things we do. Sometimes I get so enthusiastic, I feel like a cheerleader on speed. I am so eager to express my happiness and contentment to family, friends, and neighbors, but I realize that I've never actually told you, the person who made it all possible. This is my thank you. I am overwhelmed with gratitude for the opportunity to work at such an extraordinary company. Imagine if you came to work every day and this is the sentiment of all the people around you. This is what happens when you don't leave culture to chance. This is what happens when you are deliberate 
about building a culture at an organization that people want to be part of, that people strive to be part of. And I, it, it blows my mind to think about the fact that the average adult in America, we spend the majority of our waking hours at work. So why wouldn't we want to work in an environment that feeds us with energy instead of sucking the life right out of us? Why? Why do so many people in our communities all around America spend our time being frustrated with our job instead of enacting something to change it? And everyone in this room, no matter what your role is in an organization, has the ability to change that. And I'm going to finish with this, one of my favorite quotes from George Eliot. It's never too late to be what you might have been. So go build a great culture. Thank you so much for your time.